Well, good morning. This is the day the Lord hath made. We will. Now, you kind of say that with a smile, all right? This is the day the Lord hath made. We will. Amen. Isn't it great to be a Christian? Wonderful to know Christ and to live for him. Well, Pastor John, uh, you see, I'm not him. Uh, he uh, uh, is not going to be here this morning. We want you to pray for Pastor and his family, Betty especially, and her mother, Mrs. Calhoun. Betty's uh, a brother, I believe it's his, her older brother, uh, lives up around uh, Elizabethtown, between there and Lexington, uh, is very ill. In fact, uh, he's going to pass away. He has liver cancer, and uh, they found that out uh, he was in the hospital and they pumped all kinds of fluid off his body yesterday and the family was called in and uh, they were there most uh, of the night and I think Pastor John's home right now but it was probably in the hours of this morning before they got back and so we want you to be much in prayer for them and this hard time for the family last year Betty lost one brother then she lost her father just recently and now she has another brother that's uh, about ready to pass away. So be much in prayer for them. All right? Very important to do that. Have a few announcements to make. First of all, I want you to be here tonight for uh, discipleship at uh, 5.30. All right? It's very important. And this is called Connections on Sunday night. And uh, very important to be here. And uh, whether you're a young Christian or older Christian, it's good to re be reminded of the fundamental things about the Christian faith. And so I would like to encourage you to be here for that tonight at 5.30. Do that. And then today, uh, there are going to be some uh, people that are going to be helping our young people to go to camp. If you like pizza and if you go to CeCe's today on the west side, 20% of your check will go back to the church here for the youth camp. All right? So if you, yes, ma'am. Okay. Speak real clear when you say that. I'm with Mill Road Baptist. No, I'm talking about people when they're there. Let them know. Okay. All right. And so that's today. And then next, or the 27th, the same thing will happen at Hacienda. We're not promoting these companies, but they... Uh, are providing uh, a support for our young people. And so if you are disposed to eat those things, uh, then uh, be sure to go and support uh, our young people by doing that. And so it would be a blessing to do that. And then I want you to uh, remember that coming soon will uh, be a, a program, a project we have, called the Three-Month Tithing Challenge. And... Uh, the Word of God tells us to prove the Lord. He said, prove me and try me now here with saith the Lord of hosts. Uh, if you obey me, I'll open up the wind of heaven and pour out on you a blessing that you can hardly receive it. And that's a promise of God. And uh, the pastor and the leadership of the church has uh, uh, made a decision that they're going to challenge our people, every member of our church, to be a tither and to tithe. And we're going to ask you to do that for three months. And at the end of three months, if God has not blessed you and you feel that you've been shortchanged for God, you just tell the, the, the church, uh, the pastor, uh, about that. And uh, they will return all of the money that you've given for that three months. They'll just return it. Uh, we feel confident enough to believe that God means what he says. And so... If you're faithful to try, try him and, uh, and put him to the test, we believe that God will bless you and honor you. So this is going to be coming up soon. And uh, uh, Pastor asked us to make that announcement, ask you to be praying about this project of our three-month tithing challenge. And so uh, these things will be happening. Uh, I got good news today. Rayanne sitting up here on the front seat, so... She might be able to tell us. I've been told that uh, you got news about uh, your test this week, no right? Cancer. No cancer? Yeah. Amen. Amen. So that's good. Praise the Lord. 
every day is another good day, right? Amen. All right, and so we praise the Lord for that. Um, we want to pray for those who can't be here. We want to pray for the sick and pray for our missionaries that God would be with them. And so today, let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, uh, just uh, pray. Is there someone else who has an urgent prayer request that you want us to remember in prayer? Anyone? Yes. All right, Megan. All right. Yes, ma'am. I was yesterday. Uh, her husband had church children. The Lord away. And uh, the and the Okay. All right. So let's pray for that. Jackie's request. Yes. All right, so let's pray for Roger's brother. That's very important. Yes. One time, a friend of mine over 30 years was found out that she has some cancer. All right. All right, let's pray for that. How many of you have? A, yes, John. Any of you want to hire John for thirty dollars an hour? Just be sure to see him. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Any other? We have these. You will. Don't be selfish now. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's let's really pray for these things. Pray for our missionaries that God will be with them. All right. It's very important to do that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence today, we're so thankful that we can come to this place and we can pray and we can seek your face. And Lord, as we come to you today, I pray that that would just help us, Lord, to be strengthened by your spirit and by your power and by your might. And Lord, I pray that we'll be encouraged in all of the things of our life uh, that uh, through every experience of life and in every way, we are able to bring glory and honor and praise to the name of our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, as we come to you today, I pray that as we stand before you today or stand before you today, that you will just cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That would purge us, Lord, and make us pure. And may every one of us search our hearts right now if there be any sin, any wicked thing, that would hinder us as we fellowship with you in the word of God, that you would just uh, cause that we confess it to you in our hearts and ask you for cleansing and for forgiveness. And Lord, I pray today that you will anoint uh, me with the presence of your Holy Spirit because, Lord, there's no good thing in me. I know that. And I don't have any abilities other than the ability that you give me and God, I pray that you'll give us the ability to minister and to preach your word today. And Father, as we study this fourth chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians, and as we talk about this very sensitive subject that is here in this book, in this chapter, I pray that thou would speak to our hearts about it, and thou would make us, Lord, to be the people that you want us to be. Father, lead and guide and direct in all this time. We do pray for every request that has been made here today. We pray especially for Betty and for her mother, Mrs. Calhoun, and the rest of the family, Lord, that thou would be with them during this time of anxiety and grief. Lord, we want to pray for these others that have made requests, that have needs today. And then there are many here in this room that have unsaved loved ones. And Lord, I pray for them that you'll speak through their hearts. And, Father, you convict those that are in need of Christ of their sin and cause them to turn to you and to be saved. We want to thank you for the good report uh, that Ray Ann had. Lord, we pray for her, and we thank you for that. And be with her and continue to bless. And, Lord, may these other things they found, may they, they not be anything serious for her to have to be concerned about. Lord, I ask today that when we leave this place, 
that we will be different people than when we came. Uh, have your way in that, Lord. And we'll thank you for all, for we pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. 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 You know, we're all saved by God's grace, right? Amen. It's by his grace. There's no good thing in any of us, right? Today I'm going to be talking to you about a very sensitive subject. And that subject is pride. Now, not many times we ever hear messages on pride. But this whole chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 4 is about pride. And I just trust that God will deal with our hearts about this because pride is a major, major, major problem with most all of us. And we need to understand that. Uh, if, if you're one of those people today say, I'm humble and I'm proud of it. <laughs> no, no. That's not a humility, is it? If you're proud of your humility, then you're not humble. And so we need to understand what humility is. We need to understand how dangerous pride is. And we need to ask God that he would just deal with our hearts and speak to us about that in a wonderful, uh, in, in a meaningful way today. I, I want us to all stand to our feet and let's sing a little course uh, together, a song rather, it's not a course, but that song is Amazing Grace because we're saved by God's grace. It's not us at all. It's all by the grace of God. And I just want us to sing that together. Okay, let's sing Amazing Grace. Amazing how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace, twas grace that. turn around and shake hands with somebody says Jesus loves you and I do too all right amen all right when you've done that All right, when you've done that, turn this way, and we're going to read these verses out loud. All right? We'll stand in reverence to God's precious word. These verses, what's that? Am I on? It shows it green here. Okay, here we go. And I got it up on the screen. Here, let's go together. Let's in unison. Therefore... Judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. And then shall every man have praise of God. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sake, that you may learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, but that no man, no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Amen. You may be seated. 
One of the biggest problems, we've been talking about this church at Corinth and dealing with their problems from chapter 1 to chapter 4 here. By the way, next, next week I believe we're going to be getting into the prophecy concerning the seven churches of Revelation. And we're looking forward to that. But uh, here we find uh, these four weeks that we've had, we have been preparing us, we've been looking at ourselves, what kind of church are we, what kind of church should we be in the light of the second coming of Jesus Christ the Lord. And we've been looking at the church at Corinth. Now the church at Corinth wasn't a very nice church. Now that church was uh, founded by the Apostle Paul. But boy, it was a problem church. If you want to find a good church in the New Testament, probably you need to go to the, the Thessalonian church, the church of Thessalonica. That church is one, there's, there's not anything in, that, in the whole two uh, little letters that are given to the Thessalonican church that would uh, show you that there were any great problems at church. It was a strong church, and it was a dynamic church. But the church in Corinth was a defeated church. They thought they were spiritual, and they were not. They thought that they, they had wonderful gifts and special gifts, but they didn't know how to practice them. There was all kinds of perversion and, and, and bad doctrine in the church. And there was immorality in the church, in the point that one of the members took his father's wife and was committing adultery with her. And they were uh, getting drunk at the Lord's table and uh, all kinds of terrible things that in this church. This is a despicable church. To tell you the truth about it, it's a despicable church. And, and uh, God puts us the, these things in the word of God so that we know what we ought to be. Now, maybe they got their hearts right and they became a, a strong church and, and on down the road. But Paul was really having to rebuke them. And one of the biggest problems that they had in this church uh, is something that we struggle with today. And uh, that is the problem of arrogance and pride. Arrogance and pride. And, and, and these two things were a great difficulty in the church. It's the problem of thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Uh, to many people today uh, think that there's a great lack of self-esteem and uh, self-confidence today. In fact, they encourage people to plug into seminars all over the place that teach them how to to be more positive and to have a more positive self-image and how to build self-esteem. But the real problem that we have in our churches today and in the world today is a very opposite to that. There's a major problem because of the lack of humility. There's a great problem all over the world for a lack of humility and for the matter of pride. The Word of God has much to say about the problem of pride and the need for humility. And so we find that the Apostle Paul is dealing with this church about these things. Now, Paul has every right to rebuke this church. He has every right to do it. First of all, he has every right to do it because he is their spiritual father. In fact, if you look in verse 15, 16... You got your Bible there? I want you, we're going to have a good study here. It says, Paul says, for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ. Now, did they have 10,000 instructors? That's a lot of instructors, right? That's a lot. Because, so he's sort of exaggerating that number, but he's telling them a fact here. Though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be you followers of me. You see, the Apostle Paul was the founding father of this church. He was the founder, and then following him came Apollos. And Apollos was the pastor of the church. And he taught them and pastored them and led them and guided them. Paul and Apollos were very important people in the church. And so he had every right to talk to them like he is here and to admonish them because he was the founder of the church. And uh, Apollos and he were united. They were one uh, in, in their ministry and in their work. And Paul uses them, 
calls them out by Paulus and himself a name and says, we are examples to you. And so he can do that. Number one, he is a minister of Christ. Look in chapter 4, verse 1. Let a man so account of us or recognize us as ministers of Christ. <clears throat> a minister of Christ is a chosen one. One that God has put his hands on, chosen him, called him into the work and into the ministry. And so Paul said, I am a minister of Christ. Uh, you need to listen to what I say because I am a God-called man. Not only was he a minister of Christ, but he was also a steward. You notice it says here, and stewards of the mysteries of God. A steward is an overseer of another's possession. Now, did, did Paul possess the church or own the church? No. No. Because the church belongs to Christ, right? Right? Uh, uh, sometimes I, uh, people say to me, well, how is your church going? Well, I know what they mean by that, but I don't possess. I'm not the possessor of Milro Baptist Church. I've only been a pastor. I've only been a worker here. Who, who owns the church? Who possesses it? Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It is Christ who builds his church. And I don't care who it is, whether it be the pastor, whether it be the deacons, Sunday school teachers, our members, or whoever it is that are joined together in the edification and the construction of building and the edifying of the body. It is Christ who eventually is the builder of it. You know, we can plant the seed. We can water the seed. We can nurture the seed. We can prepare the soil. But only God can give the increase. Amen? It's just like a garden. I got out and I plowed up the ground and Corrine came along. She planted the seeds. She will hoe out the weeds and she will, uh, will uh, uh, go out and, and harvest it and she will can it and I will eat it. Okay. And that's just the way it is, you know. <laughs> uh, she says, it sounds like I got a lot more work than you. <laughs> that's probably true, you know. But anyway... The Lord, he is the one that builds his church. And he is the one who is the authority. And Paul said, I'm a steward. You know, God has made us all stewards. We are stewards of his work and stewards of his ministry. The church doesn't belong to us. The ministry doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. And we are the stewards of that work. And we are to be faithful to that, knowing to whom we are responsible. We are responsible to him for that. And so he is a steward of the mystery of God. And not only that, he willingly has placed himself in harm's way to cause for the cause of Christ and for the churches. Now look at this in verse 9. In fact, uh, let's go up to verse 8. And, and he says to these people, and here is sort of a, 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 a little a scenario of sarcasm because he is trying to make these people understand how far off base they are with things. And uh, he uses sarcasm to do this, Paul does. And he says, now you are full. Now you are rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God you did reign, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God has set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were, appointed to death. For we are made spectacles unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honorable, but we are despised. Even in this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it, being defamed, we entreat. We are made the filth of the world. We are the off-scarring of all things unto this day. Can you see the contrast? Here Paul is presenting himself as a humble servant of God. He is standing between the devil and the government and everything else for the cause of Christ and the cause of the church. He is the soldier out on the front line. He is the one that's there paying the price. And if he's going to pay that price, 
Certainly he has the right to share his heart and, and what he sees as the need of this church in Corinth. Wouldn't you say so? And so we find that Paul has an authority to rebuke this church, and he does. The apostle addresses the sin of this church, and that sin is pride. That sin is pride. Uh, and, and pride is an ugly sin. Uh, pride is at the heart of every other sin. Have you ever thought about that? It is the heart of every other sin. All sin comes from pride. I don't care what it is, whether it's in the church, whether it's in your life, or whatever, it comes from pride. All sin comes from pride. Uh, in fact, uh, how did sin originate anyway? Well, there was a beautiful angel. And the angel's name, he was an archangel, really, was Lucifer. And Lucifer was given great authority under God. He was given great authority. And uh, it is believed that God placed Lucifer as the guardian over the created world that he had created, this earth that we live on. And Lucifer was a beautiful angel. He was an angel whose body played music. He was a musical being. And his body played music. And he was a beautiful angel. Uh, he was an angel that was one of the... He was the most popular angel in heaven. And this Lucifer came to a place where that he thought in his heart to be as God. That he ought to be God. Rather than God being God, he ought to be God. And so he set himself up against God, his creator. And he rebelled against God. And he was such a powerful person and such an influential uh, angel that a third of the angels in heaven followed him. Now can you imagine that? A third of the angels in heaven, rather than being loyal to the Father in heaven, being loyal to the, their creator, being loyal to the Lord of the universe, a third of the angels in heaven said, we're going to follow this God, Lucifer. And there was a war in heaven. And they had a church split. And the war in heaven was such that Lucifer was cast down and a third of the angels were cast out with him. How did that happen? Pride. Then God came along and on this earth he made someone to take charge of the, of the responsibility that Lucifer had. And that was to manage and to control the earth. And so he created Adam. And after he created Adam, he took a rib from him and he created Eve. And Adam and Eve were placed in the Garden of Eden as lords over the creation that God had made. Here they are, every need met, everything taken care of, uh, and, and they fellowship with God every day. God came to walk with them and fellowship with them. Isn't that wonderful? But one day, and God said, of all of the trees of the garden, you can eat of anything, you can do anything you want, but there's one tree I want you to stay away from, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because he said, if you eat of this tree, you'll surely die. And one day, Satan, that old serpent, found Eve over close to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I can see her now. She's just looking at that beautiful tree. She said, oh, that is the prettiest tree in the garden. Look at the beautiful fruit on that tree. Oh, isn't that beautiful? And she was adoring a tree. And that slithery serpent. He wasn't slithery at that time. He walked on legs at that time. He came up. He approached Eve. He said, Eve? He said, isn't that a beautiful tree? She said, yes, yes. It sure is beautiful. He said, doesn't that fruit on that tree look 
awful luscious and inviting and she said oh yes it sure does and he said here why don't you take some and taste it oh no 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 you see God said that of all the trees we should eat of we can eat but not of that tree in the day we eat of it we will surely die and Satan says oh really hmm Ah, you know what God's trying to do to you? He's just trying to keep you under his thumb. He's just trying to limit you. Why? He knows this is the best tree in the garden. He knows that. He's just trying to limit you. He said, this tree is really delicious and luscious. Why don't you take it? Oh, no, no. He said, we'd surely die. He said, he said you will not die. He says, you know why that God didn't want you to eat of this tree? She said, why? He said, because God knows that when you eat of this tree, you will become a goddess. And you'll know the difference between good and evil, just like he does. And he wants to keep you innocent and in the dark. He doesn't want you to know. He wants you to be naive. But once you eat of this tree, you'll know everything he knows. You'll just be like God. You'll be a goddess. Oh, come on, Eve. Here, take this. And she takes that fruit, and she eats of that fruit, the knowledge of good and evil. When I was a kid, I always thought it was an apple. In fact, I was probably 20 years old before I ever ate an apple. Because I thought that was the same thing that Eve and Adam ate. And I didn't want anything to do with that. It wasn't an apple. But she ate of it. And when she did, her eyes were open. And, 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 and things were, oh, man, it was just, I guess, I never took drugs. But I guess like taking drugs, man, she was lighted up, man. Oh, boy, this is something. And so she takes some of that fruit and she goes over to Adam and says, Adam, you got to have some of this, man. You just got to have some, Adam. Here, take this. He says, Eve, what have you done? Well, I've, I've eaten this. You know, the servant told me that it was good. And I tell you, it's good. It's good. Adam said, you know what God said? If we eat of it and the day we eat of it, we surely die. She said, look at me. I'm not dead. You're Adam, Eve. Adam knew what was going to happen, but he did not want to be separated from his wife. And out of his selfishness, Adam, with his eyes wide open, took the fruit and he ate of it. And he brought sin upon the whole human race. And today we go through all of our afflictions and we go through all of our trials and we go through all of our troubles and we face death and we die because of Adam's sin. And what was his sin from? pride every sin is because of pride every sin has its root in pride Paul used the term here in first Corinthians puffed up he uses this this word this term puffed up three times and it means to be self-consumed it means to be haughty it means to have an exaggerated sense of self-worth it means to be arrogant. And Paul said, you all are puffed up. In fact, he uses that some more times in the book, in other places, puffed up. They were, they were puffed up, and they were. They were a divided people. Remember in chapter 1, he said, I would that you be united. I've heard there are divisions among you and arguments and stress and strife. I would that it not be that. You should be united, one mind, one heart, one purpose, one plan. What causes division? Pride. Being puffed up, that causes division. They were divided, these people were. And not only that, they were judgmental. They, they, they were passing judgment. They were choosing special leaders. And some people said, boy, I want to tell you, the man of God, the man that's really got it on, that's Apollos. Somebody else said, oh, no, no. I tell you, Paulus doesn't have anything. It's Cephas. And there's some, oh, no, you guys don't know what y'all know. I, I tell you what, it's Paul, man. I follow Paul. 
and they were all divided and fractured in the church. And then there were people following this person, that person, somebody else. And they were divided. And they were judgmental. And so we find that Paul talks to them about it. And look in verse 3. Paul says, uh, But with me is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of man's judgment. Yes, I judge not my own self. There are three judgments there. Look at that. First of all, he said, I don't care what you think about me. You know, I've learned a long time ago. I've been in the ministry now oh, about uh, 62 years. And I learned way early in my life that I couldn't be concerned what people thought about me. That doesn't matter. Sometimes you have to be very unpopular with people. Sometimes you have to make people mad. Sometimes they get plumb disgusted with you. But if you know you're doing God's will and you're preaching the truth and you're leading in the direction of the Holy Spirit of God, it doesn't matter what people say about you. It just doesn't matter. You just have to plow your roll of corn and keep on going and don't get upset by the criticisms of people. I want to tell you what Paul said. I don't care what you say about me. It's not important what you say about me. He said, you know, you don't need to do that. He said, you're only doing it because you're prideful, because that you're carnal. That's why judgment comes. You know, there are some, oh, you know, Paul, he's a poor preacher. I mean, he doesn't use a good language. I mean, he's all stooped over. He's ugly. Somebody, I heard somebody say the other day, if you were going to be a, a, a great preacher, you had to be a good-looking fellow. <laughs> Maybe in 62 years, that's why I'm not great. <laughs> but I tell you what, Paul said, it doesn't matter. And then he said, I don't even judge myself. He says, I don't judge myself. He said, I, I don't know anything wrong, he said right here. I don't know anything wrong that I've done. But he said, it doesn't matter what I think about myself. He says, what matters is what I am going to be judged by, by the Lord. He says, I judge not myself. But he says this in verse 5, therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart and then shall every man have praise of God. It's the Lord that makes the judgment. Amen? And so we find that they were judgmental and critical. And then they were self-righteous in verse 7. Uh, they were making like that they somehow or the other had created this spiritual atmosphere or they had brought about this church. He says, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And why hast thou not that, 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 uh, what do you have that you have not received? Now, if you did, did receive it, why do you glory as if you had not received it? He's saying to them, You didn't write the song. You're only singing it. There's a difference between being the composer and being the singer, Right? And these people were acting like they wrote the song. They were acting like they wrote the book. They were acting like they wrote the doctrine. And he says, you, you didn't get anything except you received it from me. God revealed it to me. I didn't create it. God gave it to me and I gave it to you. So why are you acting like that you have brought about some great revelation or thing? You haven't done anything. You're only singing the song. You're only singing the song. It is God who brought it about. And so these people were self-righteous. And uh, then they were ungrateful, as we see here in verse 8 to 13, which we have already read to you. Now, what does the Bible say about pride? Let's just look at this for a minute. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And again, in Proverbs 11, 2. When pride comes... Then comes shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. Proverbs 13, 10. Only by pride comes contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Whenever you have strife and contention, you just know that the root sin is pride. Always, always pride. Whether it be in a church, whether it be in a home, whether it be with the family members, 
It is always pride that causes contention. Again, the Bible says in James 3, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Now, I want you to see this, that pride is the potent force of destruction. You see, because of Satan's pride, we have such evil in the world today. Pride destroys families and homes. Would you have great fights and disagreements if it weren't for pride? Huh? Just think about this. What causes your argument? Well, one has one opinion and another has another opinion. One wants to be boss and the other also wants to be boss. One wants to have his way and the other wants to have his way, right? Now, is that the way of a servant? Does a servant exert his way? No, what does a servant do? Master, whatever your will is, that's what I'm going to do. Now, I wonder if a husband and wife were both having servants' minds and they both were just servants. And each they saying to the other, Honey, it just doesn't matter because whatever you want, that's the way that it ought to be. And then the other say, No, well, you know, that's the way I feel too. So let's find a place here to have an agreement. You see what would happen if there wasn't any pride there? It's pride that causes contention with our kids. Pride is at the heart of rebellion. It's at the heart of disagreement. It is the thing that causes us to be bitter in our hearts and bitter in our lives. It destroys families and homes. It destroys churches. This awful thing of pride. Pride was destroying the church at Corinth here. It was absolutely tearing the church up because of the contention and because of all of the stuff that was going on in this church. Pride destroys our nation. We have a partisan spirit, don't we? I mean, there are the Democrats and Republicans and the Independents, the, the, the uh, uh, ever who else is there in the White House and, and in, the, in, the, uh, in Congress and Senate. And they're partisan. Oh, this is my group. This is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. No, you're not going to do that. We're, we're going to do this. No, you're not. This is what we're going to do. Hey, those people are there to serve the citizens of the United States of America. And what should be is that these people should be getting together and say, we're servants. And it's not what I want and what you want. It's what is best for our country. Isn't that true? But because of the divide, we haven't even had a budget in our country for three years. They can't even agree how to spend the money. And so they just borrow trillions and spend it. Think of that. The question for us as a church is this. Will we become a dynamic congregation or will we become a defeated congregation? Milro Baptist Church. What are we going to be? Are we going to be a dynamic congregation that's going forward, happy, joyful in the Lord? Or are we going to become a defeated congregation, troubled on every hand and perplexed? Well, to be a dynamic congregation, we must become a humble people. Now, the need for the day is humility. And we need to be humble. Look at these verses. Proverbs 29, 23. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the what? The humble in spirit. Notice Matthew 18, 4. Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself and become as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Little children are humble, aren't they? Generally, they are humble. They're not full of pride, but they're humble. They are trainable, teachable, bendable, moldable, makeable. That's important. James 4, 6, wherefore he said, God resists the proud, but he giveth grace to the humble. That's what God does. 
It's important for us to see that. And 1 Peter 5, 6, Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Humility is the important thing. Now, out of the virtue of humility comes these things. Unity of spirit rather than contention. Whenever we're humble, we'll be united in purpose, one in mind, one in heart, faithful stewards of God. Love and servitude come from humility rather than envy and bitterness. Spirituality rather than carnality. You know, Paul said to these people in Corinth, I cannot speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as to babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. You are not able to bear it. But there's divisions and envyings among you and bitterness, and you live like sinners. Could that be said about most of our churches today? That the major part of the congregation lives like sinners? They have faith, they believe, but they live like sinners? Spirituality comes from humility. And Christ-likeness is the thing that we are to aim for. I want you to take your Bible and turn with me in your Bible to the book of Philippians. And I want you to read this with me. I want you to see what Paul teaches us here in the book of Philippians. In the book of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, it says this, Let nothing be done through strife and vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. That's humility. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you look up on people and do you uh, hold them in high regard as better than yourself? Think about that. In our first session, I was talking to, to, to older people, some older people. Some of them are still here with me, here in this room. But I told them, I told them about, you know, the difference in ages. Uh, older people, a lot of older people, don't trust younger people. And they're afraid of younger people. And uh, I've, heard, I've heard older people, you know, because younger people look a little different, act a little different, you know, do different things, then they, you know, they trashed them. They've thrown them away. I don't want anything to do with them. I don't. Are those older people thinking that they are better than the younger people? Yeah. I don't want to talk about you. Most of you are younger. You distrust older people? You say, man. They've, they've lived past their usefulness. I mean, they've lost it. They've not stayed up with it. I don't have any patience with them. If you think yourself better than the older people, you're full of pride. And if older people think that they're better than you, they're full of pride. That's pride. That's sin. That's evil. What about kids? You think yourself better than kids? Oh, there is kids. They'll grow up someday. What about that? Every little child is just as important as all of us, right? You know, one time, I learned something years ago. When I was a kid, I've always known I was going to be in a ministry and be a preacher. But there was a great preacher, came to Evansville Rescue Mission, a great preacher, well-known. If I name him, most of you would know his name. He was a great preacher, and I idolized preachers. My dad taught me to do that. They were the stars. You know, they were the stars of my life. I always had to go and have them to sign my Bible and put their scripture verse there and all of that. And this great preacher was at the Evansville Rescue Mission, and the people were standing up, getting in line so that he could sign their Bibles and autograph their Bibles. And I got in line with my Bible to get it autographed and I got up close to him, and I got to him, and he looked down, and he saw me. I don't know. I was probably nine years old, ten years old, and he said, kid, get out of the way. I've got too many people to talk to, and he pushed me out of the way, he didn't sign my Bible, 
And you know what? I made a decision. I said, when I become a preacher and when I grow up, I'll never push a little child away. And God knows that in 62 years, I've never pushed a little child away. In fact, a little child comes up, they generally have my attention first. Oh, you go down the street. There's a guy on the street corner. He's got a sign, we'll work for food. He got a beard out here, straggly hair, old dirty clothes. She said, yeah. why don't that guy clean himself up and go get a job? That lazy bum, why is he there? Is that pride? Is that pride? I think it is. That's pride. Here the word of God is saying to us that we are not to be that way. L the Bible tells us here, look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of other. And then he says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. That the name of Jesus every knee should bow and everything in heaven and in earth and under the earth. And that in every tongue should confess that Jesus is the Lord to the glory of the Father. Here's our example of humility. Jesus. Jesus humbled himself. Wonder if Jesus said, I'm God. I'm not going to take Bill Kellogg's old filthy sins and die on the cross. That's below me. Wonder if God had done that. Wonder if Jesus had done that. Where would we be today in hell? But he loved us. And he cared about us. And Jesus Christ took our sins and took our filth and took our crud and died on the cross of Calvary for us. Isn't that something? What a wonderful thing. And I want to tell you, humility causes us to rejoice in honor and not to have to be rebuked. This is what humility does. Now I want to ask you a question in closing. I want to ask you this question. I want you to be serious about this. If every church member were just like me, what kind of church would my church be? If every member of Mill Road Baptist Church was just like you, what kind of church would this church be? And what, if, if they were just like you, what would this church be doing? Just like you. If every member was just like me, would there be money for the bills to be paid because we're faithful to tithe? If every member was just like me, would there be people to give out tracts and to share the gospel that sinners would be saved? If every member was just like me, would, would, would people be talked about and gossiped about or would they be prayed for and encouraged and blessed? If every member was just like me, what kind of church would this church be? I think that's sort of important. That's for, sort of important. First, there are Psalm 139, 23 says this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. You know, we need to examine ourselves. It's a time for self-examination. It's time for search ourselves and say, God, would you show me? Is there pride in me? Is there a contentious spirit in me? Is there a critical spirit in me? Is there a critical spirit about my home, about my husband, about my wife, about my kids? Lord, is, do I have a critical spirit about sinners? Do I have a critical spirit about government? God, is there bitterness in me? Search me, God. Examine me. See what's in me. We need to search ourselves. I want to ask you, are you guilty of pride? You have to be honest with yourself. The proud person would say, no, I won't answer that question. I won't go there. That would be a proud person. But will you go there? Will you go there and will you answer that question in your heart? 
Are you guilty of pride? And if so, are you willing to confess that it is a sin and forsake it and ask God to give you his grace to turn from that sin? It's the sin that destroys the joy of the Christian's life. It's the sin that robs us of our power. This sin is. And then it is a sin that destroys the souls of sinners. I don't know. There may be some of you that are not saved here today. And you know why most people don't accept Jesus as their Savior? They're too proud to admit they're a sinner and to bend on their knee and say, God, I confess I'm a sinner. I need your salvation. Cleanse me of my sin and save me. If you're not a Christian, is your pride keeping you from Jesus? And if it's so, is it worth going to hell? Oh, you need to turn to Jesus and trust him. May we bow our heads in prayer.